Welcome to the Zawiya Podcast. This is Noha Al-Hannawi, and today I'm speaking to Dina Shanoufi, the Chief Investment Officer at Flat6 Labs. Flat6 Labs is one of the region's leading seed and early-stage venture capital firms. I'm picking Dina's brain about the implications of the Silicon Valley Bank failure for the MENA region. I'm also asking her about Flat6 Labs' new Africa fund. With the Silicon Valley Bank fiasco and recent bank failures in the U.S. and Europe, how could all that affect the VC ecosystem in the region? The, the biggest implication of what's happening for Silicon Valley Bank is how we perceive the West as a safe haven. And suddenly that, even that image of a safe haven or that perception of a safe haven suddenly failed. And so I think... In, in my opinion, it's both good and bad because at some level we used to perceive that uh, as the Middle East market is a very, very risk averse market. No one wants to bank in local banks. No one wants people always want to sort of be exposed abroad or bank abroad. And then this failed. It did shook up confidence. But I think on the flip side, people just will now, in my opinion, when the dust settle, will start to realize actually local banks are not so risky, right? It could happen anywhere. And maybe one of the things that will come up and now we're being asked is what is your risk metrics, risk sort of management metrics, and maybe companies should become a lot more cognizant of not having all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. So they need to diversify bank allocations. But I guess also what this would mean is that locally, I think One of the biggest reasons why people banked with Silicon Valley Bank is flexibility in terms of payment solutions and aggregations and in multiple currencies. I think it just puts a lot more of a burden on maybe local banks and local facilitations to happen to be able to provide companies with that. I feel like from my conversations with all fund managers and even portfolio companies is that this was one of those things that suddenly happened. No one expected it and no one is is seeing the sort of ripple effects of what that means for the local ecosystem from an an overall dynamic perspective. It was an exposure that no one, especially that they're so far removed. It's not that the, the, the fall of Silicon Valley Bank or Credit Suisse was directly related to the, the bigger picture of economics in our region. So you don't think there is an immediate and direct effect on the VC market in the region? I don't think so. I think it was an exposure. I think there was a big fear in some of the big companies or some of the most successful companies that have recently raised very substantial rounds were exposed. And I think the fear was it could have created a, a ripple effect. I think the worst bit would have been if if the U.S. government had come out and said we're not bailing Silicon Valley Bank. I think this could have had actually a really bad ripple effect in the sense of as generally as a market, it's not that we're I mean, we're a, a minimal percentage of the global market, right? If if five of the of the big 20 companies in the Middle East are suddenly shut down because they lost so much of their money they just raised, it could have had a wider effect. But I think now everyone is a lot more secure that the now that the most of the companies that had exposure to Silicon Valley Bank are comfortable that they're getting their money back. Do we know how many companies might have been affected by these recent bank failures? I don't have the full extent of it. I think from my observation, I wouldn't I wouldn't think that it's more than say 40% of VCs that had uh, exposure to Silicon Valley Bank as their own banking partner. And then maybe as portfolio companies, in terms of number of companies in the grand scheme of things, it's probably less than 10%. But then those are the 10% probably companies that had the biggest amounts of funding and fundraising and that were able to bank with Silicon Valley Bank. You have just launched a new fund for Africa. Can you give us an overview of its objectives? So, so this fund comes, I, I'd like to say it's like the third phase of Flat 6 Labs and, and so we're very, very excited about it. And so what we want to do now is a regional fund that is a lot more cohesive in a region that we feel is synergistic and also complementary. Um, markets that, that sort of uh, feed into each other and can be easy to target with the same product. Um, and so this fund is an Africa fund. We've we've established as Flat6 Labs really good presence in North Africa between Egypt and Tunisia, which are places that we have existing funds. Um, these funds are now both in the divestment period. But what we want to expand to is East and West Africa as markets that are close, but also markets that we feel are very similar. And so, um, for example, a product like Shefet in Egypt that we've invested in, which is a pharma product 
that serves that connects very sparse and, and multiple pharmacies with uh, with uh, clients across a, a, a country can exactly sort of be replicated in a country as busy and crazy a city as Lagos, right? Or a country as, as Nigeria. That's the idea of what we want to do is to invest in 160 African uh, companies across um, Northeast and West Africa um, in the next five years, providing them still the, will still be sort of the first founders with them or the first institutional investors with them um, and help them grow across uh, across their journey. When are you expected to make your first deployment? So we're in fundraising mode now. We haven't achieved our first close. We're hoping to start deploying by end of this year. And then it's a five year investment period. And so we would be investing over the next five years, um, probably starting like sort of end of this year, beginning 2024. And then this, as, as typical funds would go, it'd be another five years for us to create the exits. But I think the plan for us is, again, because that's what we've always done so well, is to try and really capture the underserved markets. And so um, the Francophone, West Africa, uh, the smaller markets uh, such as Ethiopia and Tanzania, where we're starting to see in Rwanda, we're starting to see a bit of a pipeline. Um, we want to sort of have a lot more activation and on the ground activities that allows us to capture that early market. In your opinion, what are the forces driving the growth of the tech ecosystem in Africa? In my opinion, I think it's largely a sudden shift in adoption. And, and, and so I, I always anecdotally say some of the biggest players in terms of, of um, startup technology companies today are companies that Flat6 Labs invested in a similar one 10 years ago. Um, but 10 years ago, the adoption was, was not there. And so companies actually struggled to find the market. Um, and I think the shift that has happened in Egypt, I would say, happened, in my opinion, with the introduction of Uber, where suddenly everyone became, because it was such a, an intuitive service, everyone needs a taxi, but people used to go down the street and, and wait to hail a cab, right? But then suddenly they realized, oh, I can do it easier. And with that, it shifted the mentality of how everyone uses their phone to conduct everything. Um, and while, unfortunately, COVID was negative for many um, on a personal basis, it also created a huge shift in the mentality of technology and remote resources, right? Um, and so I feel like those two have created a sudden shift in terms of the general market adoption and particularly on fintech because payment solutions and payment, payment facilitation became a necessity, not a luxury. Um, and, and so I feel like that alongside the confluence of very, very strong technical talent um, in those markets and a huge need for innovation. Like we are in markets that constantly need innovation. There are bottlenecks in every aspect of life. So are you in a position to ignore what's going on globally with the VC industry and to start pursuing new business opportunities in Africa? So I, I think it is becoming difficult, but I think the whole idea of entrepreneurship is to create innovation around difficult things. Um, that's the number one thing. For me, I also feel like the fundamentals of the region hasn't changed, Noha. Like I know there's, a, there's an overall cloud of negativity because of global affairs, because of wars that are happening, because of um, sort of changes in, in currency fluctuations. But the truth of the matter is the fundamentals haven't changed. You have the smart founders, you have a very, very huge market and a very huge population. You have um, an increasing uh, an increasing middle class, you have uh, a huge wealth of youth. Do you have any concerns about homegrown challenges that you may face in Africa? Things like laws, regulations, probably corruption or unfair competition? All of the above. <laughs> We're definitely concerned about all of the above. But again, I think it's, there, it's not something that we haven't uh, we haven't faced before. We're very cognizant. I think one of the things that we try to do to facilitate these things is to sort of uh, create standardized structures for the companies. There, there, sti there still remains to be multiple jurisdictions that make it very easy for any founder of any nationality to set up and it becomes a standardized process. Um, it even helps later stage uh, investors when they do come to look at, at sort of portfolio companies of Flat6 apps to realize it's one structure that becomes very familiar to, to them. Um, and so we're not 
uh, we're not blind to these challenges and, and I think they end up being challenges that you have to address one at a time and they're not a one size fits all. So we're very familiar of these challenges that we have to look at and sort of start addressing um, in each location set differently. You announced that you're going to raise $95 million for your Africa fund. Are you confident you can do it in the midst of this global economic crunch? Yes. So yes, we are confident. Um, but just to clarify, 10 million of the 95 is going to be a Tunis only vehicle. Um, and so that's going to be a local vehicle targeting only the Tunisian uh, LPs. Um, and then it will be co-investing alongside a bigger vehicle, which is the $85 million vehicle, which would then be targeting all of Africa or the mandate, which is North, East and West Africa. Um, we are in very good conversations with quite, of our, uh, with quite a number of uh, European DFIs, um, as well as uh, multilateral uh, DFIs, um, as well as quite a few family offices, uh, high net worth individuals and impact investors. Um, we do have uh, a long-standing relationship with the IFC, and so we feel very strongly that they would also be one of uh, our LPs in this Africa Seed Fund um, and quite a few other investors that we are in good conversations with. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your insight with us. Thank you, Noah. It really has been fun and a pleasure. Thank you.